Hello. We're just going to go through a few notes on experiment nine, which is the second to the last experiment for the semester. Hey guys, we're making it through this weird semester. And there's not a whole lot to say about this because really what you're doing is you're just looking at the appendices back of the book and utilizing information about our solar system, about our sun to fill out different areas. Uh, within experiment 9 and so from page 109 on. Uh, I'm going to make a few comments uh, just to make certain that you are clear about a few things to aid you. This experiment is due in one week on Monday which is the I believe the 11th and then we have one more experiment after that and I'll put those uh, lectures up relatively soon, those lecturettes. So first off, just to make a few comments, again, read the very first of the experiment and then fill out the questions on the top of page 110 from the reading from the very beginning out, out to those questions. And just looking at the uh, idea behind uh, the definitions, remember eccentricity is for an ellipse, just how much squishedness it is. Eccentricity is the length. Remember, if this is a two foci, this is the major axis, is the length between the two foci. So I'll call it F1, F2. I'll put a line meaning the length between the two, uh, two divided by the major axis. You'll see this in uh, defined better in experiment seven, which I'm trying to grade right now. And uh, uh, so I'll get that back to you relatively soon. So uh, that's what that's talking about. M uh, major planets are, you know, the, uh, the large eight planets, and that's Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus, Neptune. Yes, it is Uranus. That's the actual name, but you can call it Uranus. We're, we're a little tired of the joke. But uh, anyway, minor planets, there's two ways to say this. Minor planets are dwarf planets. These are small planets. And so an example is Pluto. Now we have assigned Pluto that uh, uh, identifier as a minor or dwarf planet. And so uh, going on to page 111, uh, you know, we all these uh, things are basically listed within uh, the uh, appendix four. Rotation period is just how long does it take a planet or a dwarf planet to rotate once about its axis. For us, it's 23 hours and 56 minutes. We discussed that at the beginning of the semester. Uh, escape velocity is what speed do you need to have in order to escape the gravitational well or the gravitational pull of a planet so you can fly a away. And that's listed in Appendix 4. Mass density, mass density, just so you know, by the way, it has a symbol. It's a Greek letter, which is rho. Rho is just how much mass there is in a cubic meter. So in other words, a box uh, with each side having a length of one meter. And so that's mass uh, density, and that's given in terms of kilograms per meter cubed. And so uh, what we find is relatively low mass density, and we talked about this in chapter 11 before we left into this weird little environment that we're living now from campus, where mass density is low if it's a gaseous object and relatively high if, if it's a more of a, a rocky metallic planet. And so roughly, you know, gaseous Mass density is less than or roughly 2,000 kilograms per meter cubed, less than that, equal to that. For that, so that's a gaseous object. 
for a rocky hard uh, mass density is going to be more than probably 3,000 kilogram per meter cubed. And so uh, you can get some ideas from the tables what those objects are probably are like. Uh, if you look at the tilt of the rotation axis, so here is the Earth. If this is the line and here's the sun, right here and here's the Earth. If this is the looking basically side on to the orbit of the Earth, the Earth comes out of this whiteboard into it and comes back around. And then if I draw a line perpendicular to that axis, so this is the axis that the Earth uh, or excuse me, the orbital plane that the Earth moves in. So let me say it again so I'm really clear. What that line right there is actually not the axis. Let me say it better. It is meaning correctly. Uh, if this is the orbit and a side view of the orbit of the Earth, the Earth will come straight out, come around, go straight in, come back out of the board and orbit. And so here's a line has been drawn at right angles to the orbit of Earth or any planet for that matter. If this is the axis, that would be the North Pole. I draw a line through that to the South Pole. Turns out the Earth is tilted by 23 and one half degrees. So that's how much the uh, uh, it's been tilted by. And that's basically H. You can just draw this and try to explain it. So I'll say it one more time. If the Earth is going around the Sun in this orbit, and then what I find is that I look at the line from between the North Pole and the South Pole, and the Earth goes around that, it's tilted with respect to a vertical line to the orbit by 23 and a half degrees. So the line between the North Pole and the South Pole, that line is tilted by 23 and a half degrees. So other planets have different tilts, and so that's what you'll look at. The inclination is this. So let me explain the inclination. Let me find my... Here it is. Okay. If I go ahead and I look at the... Here's the sun. And here is the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. So the, here's the Earth that comes again out of the board, into the board, and it goes, and this is a side view of that orbit. Uh, what's the inclination? How has it the orbits of other planets, how do they relate to where you know our orbit is? So basically they would orbit around like this, and this is their inclination. How much far off from you know our orbit would their orbits be when we look at the orbits you know as they go around the sun? And that's I there. The Oort cloud, Oort cloud, O O R T. It's really O umlaut. It's German. That means umlaut. That's uh, so. The way you say this is like a uh, like a Kind of like an E, but you round. You don't say E. You go E to so Ut. Ut cloud. It's kind of weird, huh? Anyway, what this is, is a realm of, of comets far, far out away from the sun. Farthest thing in our solar system. And there could be millions, if not billions, if not more than that, uh, comets that are just frozen in their orbits far away, maybe up to 50,000 times the distance from the sun to the uh, earth away from the sun, where the Oort cloud is located at. And there what we find is that basically they orbit in very large uh, parabolic excuse me, not parabolic, but uh, elliptical orbits, let me say it correctly, elliptical orbits around the sun, 
and ever so often they could get jostled and that might alter their orbit and they actually might begin an inward journey into the local or central part of our solar system where we are and then we see beautiful sights so that's what we want to talk about that so if we go on to page 112 uh, these are just listing going through that uh, appendix number four first part is list the major to uh, larger dwarf planets going from the smallest to the largest so that's the very first thing on page 112 so look in the back find the, the largest planets the smallest dwarf ones and all the ones in between and then just rank them on that table from 1 to 14 and so just choose the 14th lar 14 largest major and minor planets and you rank them there going from the smallest to the largest and then you do the same thing uh, on the next uh, listing of just masses and then uh, list the orbital sizes ranking them just looking over the tables looking at their masses and then also the mass density so you have these different things that you're getting from table or appendix four in the back of your textbook so it's just a matter of listing reading and listing now then there's a couple of problems in one question try to put together what this is trying uh, what a conclusion about all these different rankings and get some ideas about maybe those rankings will tell us something then we go and we look at uh, how do the orbital sizes of planets change from the four central planets which are small hard rocky terrestrial planets versus the outer planets, which are those gigantic Jovian giants. So the inner planets, again, are Mercury, closest to the sun, then Venus, then Earth and Mars, small rocky planets. Then we go out to the larger planets, which are basically uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And so what you're doing is you're uh, looking at the orbital sizes and you're just finding the differences. So find the difference in orbit between Mercury and Venus, the difference in orbit size between Venus and Earth, and Earth to Mars, all the way out to uh, the outer, smaller dwarf planets. So, and then try to answer those questions on page 115. Now, just uh, a few more things about this. Using this... Uh, uh, on page 116 answer the question at the top about the tilts and the axes and just kind of look at the differences and how they one might compare to another and then look at the number of moves going from the major to larger dwarf planets meaning you know going from you know the first large eight planets include the earth includes mercury you know all the planets there and include the dwarf planets and talk about the the moons that they have actually list the number of moons each one has and then again answer that question and then table one is basically looking at uh, uh, different moons and for this is uh, look for the largest moons and just list the largest moon and so tell me what the moon name is their planet is around its size and then divide the size of the moon by the size of the uh, by the size of the planet, and then give the mass of the moon and the density of the moon, and then answer those questions. Uh, and then uh, on appendix five in the back of the book has information about the sun, so answer those questions on the very last part of this by looking at that appendix. Not a whole lot to say about this. So I want to say this one more, uh, one more time, just to be very clear. I'll use a different side color pen. Let me go ahead 
and let me raise this. What you're going to find is that if this is the sun, I'm not going to make anything to size, then the first four planets, one, two, three, four, we have right here Mercury, and then Venus, and then Earth, and then Mars. And then in between that are, is the asteroid belt. So that's where the asteroid belt is. And then we have further out. Yeah, I'm not a very good drawer, am I? The larger Jovian giant planets. These are the gas giants. So this would be Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Just so you know, in here are what's known as the Trojan asteroids, and they're kind of held and moved together with Jupiter. So this is, again, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Out here are a group of objects very far out, and these are the Kuiper Belt objects. And these are where a lot of the dwarf planets are at. Dwarf, another name for it, are minor planets. And that includes Pluto. So that's where you finally, mainly would find the, uh, the minor planets. Now, in the asteroid belt is one minor planet called Ceres. So there is one there, and you'll see it within the tables. And it's the largest asteroid that's there, and it's actually uh, you know, big enough that it's actually a sphere. Because gravity's big enough, it has enough mass, that gravity's pushed it in all directions, so it has taken on a spherical sh a shape. Now, this is a long ways out. They're very hard to see these very, very small uh, objects. So we're discovering new ones all the time. So more than likely, uh, the tables in the back of the book will not be kept up to date as we make more discoveries. And it's not an easy thing to do. But way out here, you know, I mean, we're talking, oh, you know, how much time? more? That's 80, uh, maybe two or 300, even more times farther out than the Kuiper Belt is the Oort Cloud. Very, very far out. The furthest thing in our solar system are those comets, those frozen comets that are out there. And so that's what we're looking at. We're trying to just get some idea of what our solar system is like from this uh, experiment. We're trying to make it so you kind of compare one type to another. I, I hope that you're kind of curious how the smaller, minor, or dwarf planets compare to the major planets. And then look at the, you know, the small terrestrial planets close to the sun compared to the large Jovian giants. Hard, rocky planets versus gaseous giants. And so those are the things we're interested in seeing with this. And so uh, if you have questions, please let me know. And I'm going to be around watching. I am grading, grading, grading. I'm hoping by the end of the week to post your, uh, your uh, spreadsheet for your grades. I'm just trying to make it through some more grading. Anyway, uh, this finishes up the small little discussion on Experiment 9. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of reading Appendix 4 and 5 and just putting together the information. And the, probably the most difficult here is answering the problems and questions. And, uh, you know, just use your imagination. I'll give one example. On page 117, the problem says, what can be said about the Earth-Moon pair? Well, one thing that you'll be able to see is that uh, my goodness, the moon is relatively large compared to 
the Earth. Now, there's bigger moons than ours. Uh, the largest moon is the moon of Ganymede, which is orbiting Jupiter. But when you compare Ganymede to the size of Jupiter, it's much smaller in proportion to the size of Jupiter. So that's one thing you can note about the Earth-Moon pair. Uh, we have a relatively large moon compared to the size of our planet and compared to what the sizes of moons are to their own planets outside the Earth. Those are the type of things you want to kind of put together. So look over the data closely. Look over those tables closely. One thing I should turn to, let me go ahead and turn to the appendices. I probably should make a, a point to describe something. Uh, just to look at this more closely, we see table one. And appendix four has to do with the planets, has to do with the, the radius of the planets, the mass of the planets, uh, the density per, uh, compared of the planet compared to the density of water, which has a value of one. Uh, rotation periods, how that's their day length. The tilt of their, rot of their rotation axis, meaning how far has the planet been tipped over. Surface gravity, in other words, how strong is the gravity compared to that of the Earth. Uh, if you see, look at that, Earth has a value of one, meaning that uh, the Earth has one or Earth gravity. Of course it would. And so if it has an Earth gravity of 0.378, it means that you would weigh roughly about a third on that planet compared to what you do here. Compared to, say, a planet that has an uh, amount of, of uh, 2.3, so there you're going to weigh more than twice as much than here. Then the escape velocity, how fast you have to uh, move in kilometers per second. So don't be confused. A kilometer is just simply a thousand meters. Kilometer a meter is what that means. So a kilometer, one kilometer, one km. That means 1,000 meters. All that means. And so we have that. And then the surface temperature, how hot is it? And this is in Kelvin degrees. And you can always go online and you know find a place where you can convert Kelvin degrees to Fahrenheit if you want to get a better feel for what, what it means. Table 2 has to do with orbital data for the planets and the larger uh, dwarf planets. So the larger ones, are the dwarf planets, are Pluto, Haumea, Make Make, and Eris, and Ceres. And I'm certain I'm mispronouncing Make Make. Uh, so look online and then you can correct me. I'm from Idaho, you know that, guys. Uh, language and me, it's not, it's not fun. So on table two, you're looking at the distance of the object from the sun uh, in terms of kilometers or astronomical units. Remember, one AU is uh, equal to about 92.8 million miles, which is the distance between the Earth and the sun. And so we use AUs as units of distance in solar systems. We have their eccentricity. That's how squished their orbits are for these objects. We have the orbital period for them. How long does it take it to orbit? Obviously, for the Earth, it's one year. So these are all compared to Earth years. So the Earth has an orbital period of one. Look at this. Neptune takes 167.8 uh, years to go around one time. Uh, you and I will not live long enough to see Neptune make one complete orbit around the sun. Uranus takes about 84 years, so you have a pretty good chance of seeing that. To have eccentricity, the inclination, again, how far, if this is the sun and this is the Earth going around the sun right here, how much away from our orbit is another object's orbit? Hope that's clear.
and then the average speed that they move around. Because remember, from Kep uh, what we do know from Kepler's second law, where we looked at this in the uh, experiment seven, is that as planets move around, they change their speed. Remember, they change it in a very specific way. When a planet is very close to the sun, they go fast. When they go far from the sun, they go slow. And so what this does is it gives the average amount of that. And then finally, table three is all the information in appendix four about the moons. And so it gives the Earth, moon, Mars, moon, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, Haumea, and Eris. Now, just so you know this, guys, uh, all those moon numbers, again, how many satellites the planet has, changing all the time. We discover new things all the time about planets, and including how many moons they have. So we know that that information has changed since this book was published. So don't be surprised if you look this up in, uh, online that the numbers will vary. Uh, you have to kind of com continuously edit this because that stuff is always changing. Uh, and then we have Appendix 5, which has to do with our sun, in which we've seen some of these uh, before when we talked about, uh, you know, Chapter 11 in the class. Excuse me. And uh, so it has the radius, the mass. And again, what was some of the evidences that the sun is, is uh, a gaseous object? Look at the average mass density in table one, and look at the rotation periods, where the rotation rates are not the same as you go from one latitude to the other. That's how far north or south away from the sun's equator. Look at that. And then we have percentages. And so only one last thing I'll say, and then I'll let you go. And that is, at the very end, it talks about two, uh, three populations of stars in the heavens. Call them population one stars, population two stars, population three stars. Population one stars are the youngest stars. Our sun is one of those. Population two stars are the oldest stars visible that we can see. And we predict that there is a third population of stars, population three stars. The very beginning stars. Population three stars are the very first stars ever formed. Now, what we know is that all population three stars are small, cool, dim stars by the name of red dwarf stars. Now, how we differentiate from one population to the other is something we call metal content. Now, uh, we use the term metal here differently than our chemistry peop uh, friends do where there's very specific chemical reasons in the structure of the atoms of metals. And we're, doing, we're using this as a, in a much more general way. And what that general way is, is this. Uh, the idea here is that uh, the very first uh, atoms formed in our universe in any large numbers it's the simplest atom, which was hydrogen, and then the second simplest atom, the helium atom. And so most stars are primarily made from hydrogen and helium, reflecting the early preponderance of those two atoms, forming all the material uh, matter in our uh, universe. Those are the basic building blocks of stars. All the other atoms had to have come from the processes that stars use to produce energy. And so the very first stars should not have any other atoms within them other than hydrogen and helium, because no stars were there beforehand. And so those would be the population three stars. So we're looking for stars that have basically no other atoms besides hydrogen and helium. The metals, which are any atom, uh, atom type other than hydrogen or helium, is not found there. Now, older stars, or excuse me, actually younger stars, let me say it correctly, stars formed since the 
beginning of the universe, well, they were born after some of the very earliest stars died. And as they died, they basically spewed their inner parts into the surrounding space. And it, those gases, which included lots of hydrogen and helium too, but also atoms that were heavier, atoms other than hydrogen and helium, those are also spewed within the surrounding interstellar medium, which is mainly gas and dust. And so what happens, those atoms from the star mingle with the star of the gases there, and over time, that interstellar medium, now holding atoms from the old star that died, can come together to form new stars. Now that new star not only has hydrogen and helium in it, but it also has larger atoms from this dead star. And so the oldest stars we possibly can see now, which we call populations two stars, do have metals in them, but a relatively small amount. We're talking less than 1%. And again, they lived long enough that they died and then their stuff mingled along with everything else from the older stars mingling within the gas and dust, and then newer stars were formed. And that meant that these newer stars, population one stars, like the sun, which is roughly five billion years old, so it's not that new, not that young, but still population one, has a, a larger percentage of metals than population two or population three. You know, we're talking 2% or roughly. But anyway, so that's where those population 1, 2, and 3 stars came from. So I hope, you, hope that helps you in answering some of the questions about those populations. So guys, we have one more experiment to talk about, and I will post those this week. So all the lectures for all the remaining labs will be posted. Next week, I'll... I, I will post uh, review lectures for the last midterm and uh, just keep watching as soon as I can I'll get the uh, spreadsheet sent out to you guys. I'll post it on canvas on the home page. So this will be whole, uh, this lecture here will be posted to the home page today for the laboratory exercise. Anyway guys, hope you're all doing well. Just tough it out just a few more weeks you're gonna make it. I can guarantee it. See you hopefully at, in the uh, office hours, which I will have for the remaining uh, parts of the semester on Mondays at 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. Please show up. Let me say hi to you. And uh, coming to the end. Bye.